I'm uh, Marsh Kelly, you're a moderator, and uh, these are your panelists, same rules as before, 15 minutes and so on. Um, I will introduce each panelist as um, they stand up. Wayne, would you mind closing the panel? So again, as this morning, we'll just go in the order uh, as printed in the program, and therefore we will start with mutual aid or public good, Virginia constitutionalism and Republican ideology, presented by Samuel Kuhnschneider and Maggie L. Ward of School. Just a No, well, I think to present, maybe it's a little easier. Stand up there. Yes. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, this is going to be a much more, I think, straight and historical piece uh, than a lot of the more theory heavy pieces uh, that we have, so you don't have to ask trivial historical questions. <laughs> um, uh, community in the early republic and constitutions presented the dilemma for America's founding generation. What should be the state's role in regulating both relations between citizens and the development of citizens and communities related to one another? In many ways, they faced Kropotkin's dilemma, who at the start of this 20th century worried that in the modern world, the state alone could represent the bonds of union between its subjects, and no separate unions between citizens could exist within the state. Kropotkin thought the state's alienating presence replaced organic interactions between individuals, which could result in mutual thriving. But in refining the politics of Virginia in the period between 1775 and 1800, the founding generation turned to constitutional and legislative solutions as well as classical ideas and classical language to deal with the difficulty of their dilemma in understanding citizen virtue and a form of mutual aid in their new democratic policies. The framing of constitutional systems in the revolutionary period posed a theoretical problem because to their framers, they returned individuals to their social relations direct of the state in the revolutionary order. And it was up to the authors of these constitutions to restore the proper relations between individuals and a new state. Jefferson Hillary, Virginia's 1776 Constitution and the process of its writing along these lines in notes on the state of Virginia, arguing that, quote, necessities which dissolve a government do not convey back to its authority, back its authority to an oligarchy or a monarchy. They throw back into the hands of the people the powers they had delegated and leave them as individuals to shift for themselves. A leader may offer but not impose himself nor be imposed upon them. Much less can their necks be submitted to a sword or their breath held at will or caprice. How, then, could America create constitutional systems which allow citizens to be bound in three ways? First, to one another, second, to their states, and third, to a national government, without unduly impinging either on the citizens' natural rights or the citizens' social and mutual relationships. The answer in Virginia came in two parts. First, the government is not embodying or managing, but instead enabling citizens to organize and create the common good. Second, the harmony between virtuous citizens and the virtuous citizens' obligations to the community is reconceived through the lens of Greece and Rome, the preferred civic language of that generation. J.G. A. Pocock, whose book The Machiavellian Moment profoundly influenced how we understand the language of civic virtue in the 18th century, wrote that for the framing generation, quote, civic humanism denotes a, denotes a style of thought in which it is contended that the development of the individual towards self-fulfillment is possible only when the individual acts as a citizen, uh, that it is as a conscious and autonomous participant in a decision-making political community, the polis or republic, that makes one a citizen. According to his understanding uh, of republican government and citizenship, public-spirited participation in the self-governing political community is the pursuit of the common good. However, the degree to which Virginia's version of republicanism embraced not only citizen interaction with government, but also voluntary citizen interaction with other citizens in a way that resembles mutual aid networks is an important nuance. The Virginia Constitutional Convention and Legislative Session of 1776 exemplifies this dynamic. The Virginia Convention that sat in the summer of 1776 was to hear citizen petitions in addition to its other work of drawing up a constitution for the newly independent nation of Virginia. One such petition illustrates how the state was not conceived of as replacing the bonds among citizens, nor their mutual relations, but instead as aiding and smoothing the operation of those relations. So here's the story. The area around Port Royal 
including the counties of King George, Caroline, and Westmoreland, near the Potomac River, had for a long time cooperated in the maintenance of a passenger ferry. But the proprietor of that ferry had now ceased cooperating with the other members of the community and maintaining it for their mutual use. The citizens of these counties sent a delegation to the newly independent legislative commission, and that legislation and that uh, delegation came before the commission uh, with a petition demanding that this uh, problem in their mutual uh, aid for one another uh, be resolved. They asked it to help the community establish a new ferry without the confusing and conflicting property grants and individual uh, rights of ownership that the previous ferry had had. There were so many claims like this one about the maintenance of mutual projects and obligations that a whole separate and specific committee of this sitting legislature was dedicated to them. This was called the Committee on Propositions and Grievances, and it heard and investigated a variety of claims, like those of the, of the ferry proprietors, in small closed sessions and sent investigators around the Commonwealth. In the case of the uh, ferry operators, it allowed them to create a new ferry system anew. It heard many other ideas, from the establishment of church vestries to the renegotiation of renter landlord agreements, and it was much busier than even the military-oriented Committee of Public Safety that was to protect the newly independent nation against the British. It was even busier than the committee tasked with, the, with drafting the Virginia Declaration of Rights and the state's constitution itself. The business of this all-important committee was investigating the conflicting claims about the public business of the colony and citizen interaction. It was participating in what Douglas Bradburn called a citizenship revolution, regrounding the relationship of citizen to state and relationship of citizen to citizen. In a community, in a government grounded in popular sovereignty and popular participation, legislative bodies and their committees became not an external or alien force separating citizens from one another, but enablers of the citizens' relations to one another. An additional example of this sort of process is a June 19th petition to the committee by a collection of British-born Virginians who were so worried about the pending conflict and war that they sought special per permission from the House to be permitted to depart the colony, and for that purpose, to purchase and fit out a vessel and to apply to the commander of the British fleet for a passport for said vessel. That's a quote from their petition. These citizens had turned to this sitting constitutional convention, even though it was composed of revolutionaries who very clearly disliked Tories like them, to enable and validate their mutual cooperation. One final example of the kind of thing the 1776 Convention did to enable mutual relationships is in the actual ordinances that it produced, which are surprisingly short, they're like 20 pages. Uh, among these ordinances, there's a special provision for the creation of salt works. These salt works are going to be a community endeavor built at public expense using land and labor from the surrounding communities, but remaining quasi privately owned within those communities, and selling salt to both citizenry and government at a low rate to ensure a sufficient salt supply. Like the Convention's acts to enable ferry crossings or authorize peaceful exile, this demonstrates the way the Convention's consideration of petitions from and created in order to benefit citizens' uh, organization and support with one another was a crucial element of its success. Though these are not instances of the classical or anarchist conception of mutual aid, uh, they are important and do not fit into a neat modern conception of a welfare state or a right libertarian minimal state. Uh, so what are they? Virginia's framers probably would have called them attempts to ensure the nebulous idea of the common good, the adjustment of mutual interests, and the fostering of common bonds. Legislatures alone could not do the work of shepherding the common good. The people as a whole, especially the governing elites, needed to participate fulsomely. To do this, they needed a vernacular of virtue and an etiology of ethics that they could use to engage in the process of civil discourse together. Therefore, the second crucial element in understanding early Virginia Republicanism's method of dealing indirectly with mutual aid is their use of classical history and classical conceptions of civic virtue by, their, by participants within that culture. This dominant rhetorical mode could show up in all kinds of unusual ways. For example, in a letter to Hector St. John de Crepe Kerr written in 1787, Jefferson recounted how New Jersey farmers made wheels for their carts, a little story he's telling. Uh, and he connects it to a passage from Homer about felled poplars being used without being split to make the wheels of chariots. Uh, and he then ends the letter by saying that ours are the only farmers who can read Homer, and implying <laughs> that this is evidence of America's superior character as a republic. Though a small and, and it's kind of a silly anecdote, it does reveal how central these classical pieces of linguistic uh, appropriation were to Virginia Republicanism's belief 
that could create virtuous citizens in their relations to one another, and a state structure that could cultivate those relations. The power of classical language to embody and demonstrate the proper duties of citizens to one another and to their community is also exemplified by the reimagining of George Washington, first as Cato and then as Cincinnatus. Washington's role as Cincinnatus, of course, is so storied and crucial that it's the central theme of an entire 1984 book by Gary Wills, Cincinnatus, Washington, and the Enlightenment. But this popular work underemphasizes the degree to which the pedagogical example provided by Washington went beyond his uh, virtue in the exercise of state power, but also extended his virtue in the maintenance of community ties among his fellow citizens and his dedication to an ideal of rural citizenship. One of the most widely performed plays in the colonies during the early 18th century was Joseph Addison's 1780, uh, 1714, Cato, A Tragedy which helped to establish the familiarity of the story of Cato, not just as an exercise of virtue in state power, but in relationship to other citizens. Jonathan Sewell's 1778 American adjunct to the popular tragedy, entitled simply A New Epilogue to Cato, literally brought the performance of classical virtue by American heroes, qua classical heroes, into people's lives by giving each American figure a specific classical analog directly, so you couldn't miss the point. Um, so uh, Washington's role as one of Virginia's great oligarchs is also important here. He pursued projects like canals and turnpikes with and for his fellow citizens in the region around his estate. This furthers the analogy to classical virtue, where civic virtue comes with obligations to and with other citizens directly not just to or with the state and the exercise of state power. Uh, one clear example of this is Washington's tenure as the director of the ambitious Potomac Canal Company, which he guided uh, for five years and remained um, part of uh, outside of those five years. Uh, this canal aimed to create uh, a system that would link Virginia's Potomac River to the Ohio River. Uh, it never fully succeeded, but it was one of the largest and most successful canal projects in the early republic. Robert Ferguson has suggested that the greatest difficulty for these early Republicans, like Washington, came not uh, just in finding heroes, but in seeing themselves clearly and learning to act as citizens, not subjects. That is, how to engage in mutual relations to one another that extended beyond relations just as subjects to the same authority. In the case of Washington, the framework provided by an idealized vision of Roman patrician also offered the means for thinking of others as his fellow citizens rather than his fellow subjects. Another example, in 1775, Virginia's militias were drilling and preparing for the military conflict with Britain, and George Mason went before a militia company in his hometown of Fairfax to remark on their annual selection of new officers. He suggested that the event he was witnessing was the source of Rome's Republican strength, not Virginia's, saying, quote, while the Roman Commonwealth preserved its vigor, new consuls were annually elected, new levies made, new officers appointed, in a company thus constituted, no young man will think himself degraded by doing his duty in the ranks, which he may in turn command or be commanded. The annual election of officers for Mason had prevented the rise of Caesars and Pompeys because it led to the deepening of ties among and between the militia members themselves and those who they elected to lead them, and that this sort of system could do the same for Virginia's new Republican citizens. The embrace of classical notions of personal virtue and social obligation illustrate how the classical frame helped to solve the problem of mutual obligation. One last example. William Siff laments uh, in the 1750s the excesses of gambling and gaming among the Virginia gentry. Uh, which, because it undermined the obligations that people owe to one another and within their communities. Stiff preached to Henrico County audiences repeatedly in 1754 in a uh, sermon that got repeatedly reprinted, explaining that people had been warned, not by the Bible, but by, quote, the Roman satirists, that gambling instills vices. His classical source is quoted as saying that the gambler would teach his children and compatriots to, quote, be sure to get money, get it honestly if you can, but if you can't, be sure at any rate to get money. Is that two minutes you said? Um, to skip over an example that I use with uh, Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia, what value does this have to us today? <coughs> in Virginia's Henrico and Caroline counties today, both the local and state governments have made effective use of these models of mutual aid by cooperating with scientific opioid recovery programs like the McShin Foundation and the Orbit Opioid Recovery Based on Intensive Tracking Model. Approaches like these involve state and local governments as a partner 
when individuals are referred to nonprofit private recovery organizations which build peer to peer networks of recovery services. So they create uh, civic obligations among individuals. And similarly, developing common languages of civic virtue and modes of mutual citizenship relations. Uh, can be seen in the struggle over public space around Confederate statues in the state of Virginia today. What do we accept as our mutual shared language of citizen obligation as it is embodied in our landscape of uh, statuary and uh, public, uh, public uh, consideration? I think we'll go directly to the next speaker and then take questions at the end for all of our speakers. And so, um, our next speaker um, is Mark Weiner from Rutgers University speaking on a social theory of emergency medical services. Thanks so much. Uh, I'd like to begin with a general observation, which is that the discursive landscape of politics in the United States today and in much of the liberal developed world is saturated with the rhetoric of extinction. In different ways across the political spectrum, people are saying that their communities are dying, both metaphorically and literally. The threat of impending death was an important element in the rhetoric of the Trump campaign of 2016, for instance, from the Flight 93 election essay to the American Carnage inaugural address. And it animates discussion on the left and center about issues as varied as the opioid crisis, climate change, and the future of constitutional democracy. I think we should take these fears seriously, of course, but not simply for how they point to specific material social and political problems. Public expressions of extinction fear should be read as signs that people are looking for new or revived ways of living together in post-industrial society, driven by the historical shifts laid out in our constant description. The fears grow out of a feeling of crisis in the spiritually rooted desire for community that forms the basis for the political of the category of human experience. That the current incarnation of this fear is prominent not only in the United States, but also in European nations with stronger traditions of public welfare and technocratic management underscores that this desire is unlikely to be met within the structures of the modern nation state alone. And this situation requires theory. Uh, and in the terms of this <coughs> conference, we're led then partly back to Kropotkin, uh, a theorist of how extinction is overcome, first in the animal world, as well as to the liberal civil society tradition uh, that uh, Sam gestured to so beautifully just now. Uh, and in my own thinking and research, which, which seeks to theorize from the ground up to emergency medical services, and specifically to the pre-hospital care uh, provided by ambulance personnel, who keep people from dying in the literal sense. My intuition, which I hope in a few years will become a book, is that uh, EMS, especially EMS voluntary services, provides a useful framework through which to imagine better forms of social and political life. And I should say in, in background that uh, in the United States, EMS is structured uh, in a host of ways based on local jurisdiction. There are municipal services, there are voluntary services, there are services that are contracted out to private corporations, some services are based in fire departments, others are rooted in local hospitals. Diversity is one of the hallmarks of our EMS system. So in, in a moment of uh, overenthusiasm, I called my remarks a social theory of emergency medical services, mm -hmm. which is the book's working title. But in, in fact, I won't be offering anything so comprehensive today. I'd simply like to call your attention to three aspects of EMS that might be relevant to us. The backdrop for my interest, I'm sort of in my day job as professor of constitutional law, is that some years ago I began taking classes in uh, wilderness emergency medicine and search and rescue. Uh, eventually, I received an EMT license and began volunteering for a local ambulance service uh, in Connecticut. And I recently returned from a year in Sweden where I had the chance to ride along uh, with medics in Malmö and Stockholm. And since then, I've begun to contribute a series of articles in a kind of philosophical, speculative vein uh, called EMS for Democracy to the trade pub publication Ambulance Today. Uh, it's worth noting 
uh, in this uh, light that while the provision of medical services uh, might seem to be a natural subject to raise when discussing mutual aid, it's the most basic form of health that people can give to each other, scholars generally don't consider ambulance work through a kind of critical social theory lens. Apart from a recent book by Elaine Scarry, which considers the nature of emergency response in general, uh, she describes it uh, as not action per se, but rather as involving habits shaped by forethought, and she takes a CPR as a, as a model. Apart from that work, theorists generally have been more interested by far uh, in a related first responder institution, namely the police, about which, of course, the literature is vast. And I, I think we need a more comprehensive philosophical and political anthropology of EMS because there are a host of ways in which the everyday work of EMTs in the field isn't simply a medical matter, but rather reverberates quite deeply in culture and politics. So for example, consider the interaction between medic and patient. Uh, on one hand, the encounter is a technical one, making patients feel secure, recording their vital signs, treating their major injuries, getting them to definitive care. Those are the, the practical goals of the ambulance work. Yet if something happens in the encounter between medic and patient that goes, I think, to the psychic core of civic life. There's a long line of philosophical thinking that tells us that people come to know themselves as members of their political communities only when they're recognized as individual subjects by an institution that wields public authority. Hegel argued that it's only by encountering and being recognized by something or someone outside themselves that people become full psychological beings at all. When medics approach their patients in moments of existential threat then, offering to ferry them from a world of emergency back to normality, they could be said to engage in acts of socio-political interpolation. Medics hail their patients, we're, we're here to help, uh, and when patients respond by placing trust in medics, they accept a relation of dependence on the community that's providing for their care. Patients are guided into such activity as community members through EMS as an institution. If this process of interpolation makes how medics interact with patients significant, not only for therapeutic reasons, but also for political ones. Some of us might recall the 1989 song, 911 is a Joke by Public Enemy, <laughs> right? which became a touchstone for racially conscious protest in general, but originally was directed specifically at the ambulance service. Medics who act dismissively towards patients become the medical equivalent of police officers who rough up suspects without cause by therefore degrading public life. And alternatively, medics can treat patients in a way that foster community cohesion. For instance, when uh, patients speak a foreign language and a medic can say or to, a word or two of greeting in, in it, or when a medic appreciates perhaps some religious sensitivities that patients might have, to their emergency medical care, EMS recognizes and affirms those patients in their specific historically rooted selfhood, which in turn can help bind together separate parts of a pluralistic society. Likewise, when medics invite patients to participate actively in their own care, for instance, by asking them to hold a bandage over their own wounds, they encourage a sense of personal agency that may spill over uh, beyond the medical context. I know that my co-panelist who I've just met, Anna Keller, has conducted some research related to these issues among radical street medics uh, who seek to forge a progressive egalitarian EMS practice in their work uh, during environmental disasters and public protests. So EMS is an institution worth considering in social and political terms. That's my underlying point. And here are now briefly three separate features of EMS that I think could provide food for thought in our discussion. First, as a practical matter, EMS supplements the family. Patients often need EMS care precisely when their own families are incapable of handling a health crisis independently. In arriving on scene at a home, <clears throat> then medical first responders step in and perform uh, one of the family's key social roles, that is, uh, providing care, providing a form of, of love. But they do so as agents of the larger political the family isn't replaced by the state, nor does it dissolve into a kind of pre-existing associationalism. 
Instead, EMS supplements and supports the family unit by elevating its affections to the level of public concern. Now, while this dynamic isn't an explicit part of EMS institutional self-understanding, it's the experience of many medics in their practice of the profession. As an EMT, you spend time in people's homes, and you're called there by family members. The family is a primary avenue or site of emergency services. It's a central modality of mutual aid. Second, uh, EMS care depends profoundly on intersubjective connection and narrativization. Here's what happens on an EMS call. Uh, as a care provider, uh, you rapidly establish a connection of trust with the patient suddenly under your care. You observe his or her vital signs, you get the patient to the hospital quickly, and you tell his or her story in a document used by higher medical or legal authorities. Essentially, or in essence, a major part of EMS practice is a kind of biographical writing exercise. You observe another person very carefully, and you draw up his or her story in a report. EMS personnel are mobile storytellers. One notable feature of ambulance work in this regard is how uh, a patient's vital signs often visibly change for the better as a medic is taking them in preparing to narrativize the patient's experience. They change because the medic is observing them. Observation itself has a therapeutic effect. So this process of observation and narrativization forges a socially beneficial and Tocquevillian habit of the heart among EMS practitioners, at least those who don't burn out. Uh, and it also sends a powerful cultural signal that patients live in a community in which people take care of one another face to face, one person at a time. This is especially the case for volunteer services, but in my view, it holds for private services contracted by public authority as well. Finally, uh, EMS deeply supports the ideal of community self governance and of community itself. That's particularly the case for EMS voluntary services. When community members take some formal responsibility for their community's emergency medical care, they push back against the social atomization fostered in different ways by either the privatization of EMS, as increasingly in the United States, or its full incorporation uh, into the state, as, for instance, in Sweden. Extensive privatization and bureaucratization each have their benefits, yet they can also reduce community agency, resilience, and cohesion. Voluntary EMS provides an opportunity to knit people together to address their common existential concerns. Moreover, because volunteer services are necessarily rooted in relatively small and defined geographic regions, they push back culturally against the deterritorialization of the social imagination central to our era. Theirs is a localist biopolitics. Uh, to reference Kropotkin's historical interests, it's a politics of the village community. Moreover, in this local context, significantly, ambulance personnel openly put themselves in physical jeopardy. They expose themselves to bloodborne pathogens, they lift bariatric patients, they confront the danger of angry bystanders, they endure post-traumatic stress. And with an eye on the work of our colleague Paul Kahn, who gave the keynote at this conference a couple of years back, it could be said that this personal sacrifice nurtures the cultural preconditions of sovereignty. Sacrificial activity makes community possible, drawing the boundaries of the community to include those on uh, uh, those who may sacrifice is made. The justified celebration of EMS in the wake of 9-11 uh, and the political instrumentalization of its image in the run-up to the Iraq War, I think, involved just this kind of thing. So with these and other features of ambulance practice in mind, I'd suggest that EMS provides a helpful framework with which to imagine a socially emancipatory biopolitics as an important part of a future system of mutual aid. One that might quiet anxieties about extinction by meeting the underlying political desire on which those anxieties feed. One could spell out a, a host of concrete legal and institutional structures that might put into practice a vision of politics drawn from EMS, but I won't speculate on them here. 
that whatever form those structures ultimately would take, they would need to grow both practically and conceptually uh, out of what we might call a long march through the associations, uh, which I take to be one of the projects to which this conference pauses. Uh, thank you. This is a little Frankensteinian to steal uh, mm -hmm. a word from someone on a previous panel. Um, I'm stitching together some observations and some thoughts from a much bigger, very data-driven research project. Um, I'm going to overview the coming apart of Syria and the migration in 2015. I'm going to talk about conflicts in transit states, and I'm going to look briefly at Greek solidarians and Hungarian border wall uh, responses uh, to the migration. Um, I am leaving out a lot of economics, history, and demography, um, but I'm happy to talk about any of that during question and answer or outside. And I'm also not promoting a model for mutual aid. I'm not looking at an odd, I'm looking at it as um, at concrete ways that people associated with each other. So I started my research by analyzing and visualizing United Nations, European Union, and Hungarian police data sets. Um, I looked to the month-by-month -month mass movement of people as a corrective to the explanatory frameworks I've unsystematically developed over the last 10 years. I hope to find something about a contemporary form of mutual aid in the relationship between events and demographics. Under powerful market, demographic, and climate pressures, the Syrian state came apart. Its constituent durable solidarities of, let me squeeze these together, religion, ethnicity, region, class, uh, became collective actors in a market system and then in a war marketplace and a migration marketplace. Unleashed from the socially stabilizing forces of latter 20th century Ba'ath socialism in the security state, Network professional and managerial Sunni Arabs in northern Syria moved from the public to the private sector in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Then they founded a war entrepreneurial project. A Sunni Arab shopkeeper from Barad, north of Aleppo, told sociologist Baksha Doradoso at Puesne about his move to war entrepreneurship in 2011 as the war began. He said, to form my group, I had to sell my interior decoration shop. Given the situation, I had discounted the goods. In total, I raised $200,000, just enough to equip about 30 men. A tailor from Mara made our uniforms. I bought 20 AK-47s and 1,000 cartridges for each one, two machine guns, and some RPGs. Unfortunately, I found only one sniper rifle. Weapons are scarce and expensive. I bought portable radios and three four-wheel four drive pickup trucks. I had just enough money for petrol and to pay a salary of $50 per fighter for three months. The Liwa al Qawi, or the al Qawi Brigade, which was the most significant military actor other than the Syrian state at that time, um, and was also from Mara, he said, gave us more weapons and ammunition whenever they wanted us to attack the position. The rest of the time, we would take turns at the front in groups of 20, and the Liwa al Qawi would take care of our supplies. On our side, we'd film our attacks to get help from Syrians abroad. The filming is really interesting because, you know, the Syrian war was a war that marketed itself to donors um, through video footage. And uh, initially, this group of fighters, this early group, marketed themselves to Syrian expatriates. Specifically, as the situation got dicey in Syria, many of the wealthiest Syrians flew to France. Um, but they were outcompeted very rapidly by... Um, networks that had much, much more powerful patrons. Um, so networks associated with the Muslim Brotherhood who had a Qatari patron, or networks associated with Al-Qaeda who had um, Saudi patrons, or um, one of the most significant sources of funding arms and fighters was Turkey, who worked together with the US, and then the US pulled out, and Turkey moved masses of munitions and fighters from Libya into Syria. Um, so there's a history I'm not going to explore right now as to why this particular religion, ethnicity, region, class, that is 
professional and managerial Sunni Arabs from northern Syria became a mover of history at this point and a driver of the market system. This group of people, um, as a mass, uh, fled in 2012 from Islamist forces that had access to superior patronage. After fleeing, they brokered access to resources in refugee marketplaces in Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey. Finally, in late 2014, they pioneered and promoted through Facebook and WhatsApp the Aegean Trail to Germany, and also often uh, controlled the trafficking across the Aegean. It was mostly Syrian outfits that controlled the trafficking. <clears throat> the welfare, security, and market legacies of the Balkan and East European countries through which the migrant trail passed structured very different responses to the twin crises of imposed austerity and obligations to a suddenly enormous refugee and migrant population. Uh, the size of it, um, in 2015, when some of my friends were receiving refugees on Lesbos, there was one to 2,000 Syrians a day landing on the island. Um, in September of 2015, right before the wall was completed, 13,000 Syrians and other refugees were entering Hungary per month. And they all had to be registered there by the Hungarian police at Hungarian expense with no support from the European Union, who mandated that they register them. The migrants and refugees, who all lumped together as travelers, the travelers on the trail, did not only seek safety from a war they'd already escaped to southern Turkey and Lebanon, they also sought a strong welfare state with employment protections for professionals and managers. Abandoned by their Syrian state patron in the 90s and 2000s, outcompeted for war and refugee entrepreneurship in 2011 and 2012, unlikely to find employment of the sort to guarantee their children the lives they needed in Agnes Heller's sense of need. Professional and managerial Sunni Arabs from North Syria started an exodus, which was rapidly joined by Kurds and Yazidis of lower social standing, by professional Afghans, and eventually by populations from Palestine and East and Central Africa, all looking for a place they could consider livable. Very different actions of very different states, Syria, Turkey, Greece, North Macedonia, Serbia, and Hungary, have often been represented in the West as simply authoritarian, when they failed or blocked migrant flows or prioritized their citizenry. This is a similar operation to that which has left unanalyzed the, I'll, that big mess, I'll call it caste, the region, uh, ethnicity, class, um, religion, uh, that has left unanalyzed the caste-structured character of the uprising and the war and the self-sorting of refugees and migrants by caste. Both of these operations suggest a model of the world in which the state is over and against society and the market, and further suggests that society will be saved by the market. This stands against the Baathist ideal of society and the state over and against the market, or the recent neoliberal history in which the market was over and against society and the state. Resentment is particularly interesting as an affect with which to approach what happened in transit states. A transit state for one caste might be the home or the destination of another. In mass migrations, there are clear destinations. To live in a transit state is to live in a place that migrants and refugees don't want to live. It's not only citizens that look down on refugees and migrants. Take a moment to note that as a mass, neither did migrants and refugees see transit states like Greece and Hungary, home to tens of millions, as places fit to settle. They were simply places to be processed, acquire paperwork, and move on to a better country. Greece and Hungary in 2015 provide fascinating departures for considering the complexity of post-neoliberal mutual aid formations beyond war. Both were transit states for the mass migration. Both were debtor nations, reeling from austerity regimes imposed in 2010 in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. Both were members of the European Union, the Schengen Zone in which border controls were abolished, and the Dublin III Agreement on the registration of refugees entering Europe. Let me introduce a loose theoretical placeholder. Call it fellow feeling, solidarity, or in Arabic after the 12th century scholar Ibn Khaldun, call it Hasidia. Greek civil society demonstrated it with the refugees and migrants. Hungarian civil society did not. Both the Greek and Hungarian states struggled and failed in a multitude of ways under the combination of imposed austerity measures and the administrative burdens posed by Dublin III. Hungary took decisive state action to end its administrative burden of registering people in transit to Germany, 
by excluding them with police action, then established a new welfare benefit to encourage a higher Hungarian birth rate. Greece allowed large non-state, non-NGO mutual aid networks to informally take responsibility for welfare provision for four years. They did that in clear distinction to the way that refugee populations were managed in lots of other places. Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon used their refugee populations in extortionary ways to get resources. Um, Turkey uh, threatened the European Union that if there weren't resources given to Turkey, they would expel their populations into Turkey. Mm, Jordan and Lebanon more sort of marketed their virtue for, do for, for donations in the same way that NGOs do. Um, and it's also, that's also that, that marketing and looking for patronage and using the refugees as a way to get it is similar to what the war entrepreneurs did with their, their video models. So this is a, a vast marketplace of war and refugees that we're looking at here. It's um, what Carl Polanyi calls a market system. Um, so this has been a rapid overview of a big project, but it's adequate to explain the patterns I've found in the public data sets. And it's adequate to the interviews I've conducted with fighters, refugees, workers, and Greek solidarians. Thank you. And our last speaker today is Dana Eshi from Columbia University, who will speak on the question, does democracy in the Asian irony and digital communities breed mutual aid? Hello, everybody. So, uh, I hope uh, I'm going to entertain you as the last uh, speaker. I, I do believe that if I don't entertain, I cannot get my ideas across. For those of you who are um, first time here, I want to tell you that two years ago, because of Mark, I uh, joined um, uh, the presenters at uh, Telos. And I'm so indebted to tell us because uh, I have a book now based on that um, uh, presentation. And I have to say that uh, in my acknowledgement, I actually thank uh, David. Although I attacked him this morning, <laughs> I start my book acknowledging his uh, support. And of course, Timothy Locke was so generous and read parts of it. And this is very much. Oh. So I do encourage people to, George, uh, to join that fellows because it's an amazing group of people and it's so stimulating. And now let's get started with the uh, democracy irony, digital communities and mutual aid. So why irony? I am fascinated with irony and uh, why uh, digital communities? I came to tell us because of a Facebook, um, a Facebook message that Mark posted. Pardon Come me, to tell us. do you think we should turn the lights out to see the screen? Oh, there is no need. No. 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 Okay. no. So, um, of hopefully it's going to uh, be loading. So, uh, does democracy in the age of irony in digital communities breed uh, mutual aid? And uh, I'm going to uh, talk about a brief comparative historical contextualization, which will match my anger. So um, I came to this uh, conference if um, this is going to help me somehow. Um, OK, it would be nice to have both visuals. But if it, it's not, it's not. So let's visualize democracy as theater. Yes, say loading. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I don't have time there. So let's visualize democracy as theater with a well-written script and strong characters. Its Western version has its roots in BC Athens, and after a long sleep, it resurfaced during the British Restoration, when scholars timidly started to imagine a different type of governing structure, liberal democracy. Its center stage production came at the end of the 18th century during the American and French revolutions. Um, do you mind asking the young man there, because I really want to entertain you. There is a young man there who is going to help me. I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I'm... Do you mind helping me? It says something here, but it's not happening. So, um, Meanwhile, um, on my presentation, so I'm giving him two seconds, I have only 15 minutes altogether. So, um, 
You're going to see that I'm going to uh, talk about uh, democracy, liberal democracy, and I'm going to talk about, uh, yes! <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. So here we come from Athens with the uh, invention of ironic democratus, the power of the few viewed as the masses and the rest don't matter. The invention of the rhetorical question, the few who matter. So um, moving forward, um, it's center stage production came at the end of the 18th century during the American and French revolutions. And the founding fathers implemented a muscular Schwarzeneggerian type of democracy, not unlike the eight-time Mr. Olympia Arnold Schwarzenegger, if we were to picture it while the French went for fireworks and guillotine. Their version was welcomed with either awe or horror, depending on one's membership to the ancien regime's three states. Whether Napoleon crushed the budding French democracy at the very beginning of the 19th century or put an end to the military terror responsible for its demise is open for debate. So indeed the French gave us the new legal order and I'm going to return to this shortly. Fast forwarding through history, in the aftermath of, of uh, the Second World War, the Governors and government agree that a life of dignity for larger segments of the population, though never for everyone, was within reach. Employing thinly veiled ideology and propaganda to gain voter support or avoid being crushed by so Soviet tanks, country after country joined one of these two options of government, either the free market fiction or something else equally fictional but planned five years in advance. In advance, that something else was some form of oligarchy dictatorship. It misled the masses by promising revenge under the name of the dictatorship of the proletariat or People's Republic. In fact, no matter the choice, all forms of government advanced their ruling class and socioeconomic interests. In the West, that came with a secondary effect of middle class. Like two forces harnessed one behind another, Northwest liberalism and Soviet dictatorship rode tandem 20th century history. Liberal democracies broadened the specter of individual rights for all, which enlivened the discourse about the haves and the have-nots. Everybody had rights. There were civil and political rights, and the rule of law protected individualism connected to and dependent of free market principles, which you know they don't really exist. The right to own property uh, became as inv uh, inviolable as the right to express one's opinion. Equated as individual rights, the right to have opinion created now this fiction of the war Western world with an abundance of rights. Running behind, um, the Soviet dictatorship refused to embrace freedom of speech, and he refused to embrace that freedom of association, which we now believe is the basis of this mutual aid. Not understanding that by itself it acted as mere distraction and, de and deflection, pure propaganda, and that is my fear about her discussion about mutual aid. In their defense, the Soviets, they were also being too busy striving to achieve the fruits of a late in the game industrial revolution. Through sacrifices still hard to imagine, Soviet Russia and many of its territories did achieve socioeconomic stability collectively. At the national level, public education, public health, dignity for many, though not for everyone. In the process, they did erase people, they did erase histories, art, culture, and successfully they replaced one form of racism with another. The purpose of this brief comparative historical contextualization is to emphasize how similar and how scarily ineffective we on these two systems were. When it comes to the treatment, they are similar when it comes to the treatment of oligarchs, and they are similar when, they, um, when it comes to the treatment of the most vulnerable members of their societies, and all of them under the guise of the rule of law. The rule of law of the Soviet Empire rested with what Andrei Matyshevsky calls nominal constitutionalism, which consists of a rare combination of secular ideology, law, and the social reconstruction policy. In this sense, national constitutionalism, as opposed to a real one, has three principal characteristic features. 
the absence of rea uh, realizable human rights norms, the rejection of the judicial control of constitutionality, and the great flexibility, the substance of each norm of <coughs> constitutional provisions can be profoundly <coughs> transformed via logical, semantic, and theological interpretations and thus used in the interest of political power. Perhaps because their legitimacy was not at all robust or perhaps interested in surveillance, Soviet dictatorships tended to encourage loyalty and strong connections akin to kinship and patronage uh, within its two socioeconomic strata, the working class with the industrial or agrarian, as well as the ruling class. If the working class and liberal democracies enjoyed a superior economic standard of living compared to the Soviet workers and incomparable levels of freedom of expression, the ruling classes of both societies had comparable living styles with one caveat. The Iron Cur Curtain proved a real obstacle for the Soviet nouveau riche on their way across to shop, make Swiss banks transfers, or even enjoy a shot in the company of the athletic Western businessman and his family. Interestingly, no coup or, of, or televised revolution had produced any change within the social bonds existing prior to the fall of the Berlin Wall in any Soviet colony. The poor have survived with family help, and so have those at the top of the social ladder. Furthermore, as if influenced by Putin's imperial renaissance of St. Uh, Petersburg, we witnessed the export of legal nominalism using Matuszewski's terminology. We in the West are seemingly embracing what we might call nominal democracy, rather than us exporting our liberalism. We witness the concentration of power in the hands of the few all over the world, rather than uh, deregulation and liberalization. Um, no, it's, it's perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. Yes, deregulation. Uh, or, yes, yes, yes. Um, and this with uh, threatens liberal democracy, and uh, that is why I wonder here whether promoting solidarity within particular kinship networks, we don't in fact encourage concentration of power within particular families or religious communities. In other words, we are collaborating in a de facto destruction of the American type of democracy which we have developed post-civil war at the beginning of the Reconstruction Era and after the implementation of the expanding Bill of Rights and especially FDR's welfare state and Johnson's war on poverty. If we are uh, to accept Aristotle's definition of democracy in politics, democracy is about the protection of the poor and thus its rule of law is a continuous struggle to represent all social strata. To, uh, to do that, its main characteristic needs to be normalcy. And therefore, a lack of socioeconomic and political fear of survival, which goes to um, Mark's presentation, this fear. <clears throat> Regrettably, within today's corporate colonialism, there are no heroes to defend the meek, nor to preserve a minimum of decency for all and fight for the welfare state. So, um, which has been a somewhat reliable source of, of, rely, of, of really for the most vulnerable. America's revolutionary heroes with all their faults have been replaced by morally bankrupt charlatans of the business world. This situation seems contagious. British prime ministers who once imperially watched over Europe's demise into fascism only to partake into the subsequent Marshall's nation building plan have been substituted by isolationist mascots stra stranded on a zip line while waving small British flags, indicative of the new size of all English speaking empires of centuries past and present. I just love my English. As critical as one can be of the welfare state, seeing its demise, um, it strikes me as Stephen's refusal to pray. And I'm, I'm talking about the first uh, book of uh, Ulysses, Liliata uh, Utilantium, Turma Circundet Utilantium, the Virginum, at his mother's deathbed. That's the first book in um, Joyce's Ulysses, and the only chapter I read from Ulysses. <laughs> yeah. so many chapters. <laughs> An incomplete gesture of pedantic irreverence, lack of motherly love, which profited neither him nor his mother. Like adding one's voice to the demise of the welfare state, profits no one in need. 
But leaving sarcasm aside, which is hard for me, as you can see, uh, being able to rely on the services of the welfare state ensure democratic normalcy. And to ensure, uh, aside from going to bed listening to Fox News and awaking to some version of the uh, reality depicted by those shows, democratic normalcy has always been about uh, socioeconomic and political equality, or at a minimum about a resemblance of fairness. There has never been democracy in feudalism, although Athens claimed to have had it simultaneously with slavery. The Native Americans perhaps were the closest to it, but then they couldn't withstand either the flu nor the dynamite. With all these flaws, because the best outcome for most has taken place at times when democracy re reigned, Scholars and politicians have always thought about ways to protect liberal democracy and the welfare state while arguing for ways to ensure, ensure social dignity for all. For the most part of the 20th century, liberal democracy relied on a specific type of state, the welfare state. Now a century late, both the social safety net and the liberal democracy have evolved. The charge of this conference is reconsidering mutual aid as an alternative to the collapse of the welfare services provided by the state. So we need an anthem for mutual aid. We need to wonder whether such a course of action comes at no cost to democracy or more optimistically. If privatizing these services can improve their quality and delivery to those in need. But because we believe in liberal democracy to be flexible. I think we should keep in mind that we may discover that liberal democracy is only as flexible as a Rubik's Cube can be. So for um, brainstorming viable ideas, I merely have in mind that uh, if you read anything in French right now, Camus is um, you know, the, the hero of the moment. Um, fighting with Sarge. So my idea was brainstorming viable ideas requires underlying respect for knowledge, underlying uh, understanding of how knowledge is created and communicated. We have to avoid the um, ideological pitfalls, of course, an environment committed to the values of social dignity. Ironically, the more democratic we are virtually, the more segmented we live our physical lives. Perhaps through a pragmatic embrace of scholastic expertise and mass education, we can find a solution which does not oppose the state and the private initiative property, um, um, does not oppose in a binary uh, opposition the state and the private initiative, because pro poverty as vulnerability as the loss of our sense of community is not necessarily an Sisyphean problem, but it is the fate of humanity if left. And it seems to be this notion that a state is obligated to consider the specific needs of citizen communities, right? That the sitting body of the legislature, as a representative of the community, uh, also hears the needs of the community. That it's not necessarily a bureaucratic state structure that addresses the needs of citizens, but that the sitting legislature, which is representative of the citizens, also must hear their needs. Right? And I think that underlies the difference between the petition clause and a broader sense of merely the ability to express yourself in the context of an election um, or uh, to the larger state structure. Right? Because that's, that's where I would um, place that difference. How oh, interesting. So the petition clause itself within our constitutional structure imagines a vibrant network of, associ of associational activity. Right. And, and, and to be fair, I do want to also sort of clarify that a lot of this is not only associational, they are individuals, right? right? But one of the most sure. common things that individuals came before the Virginia Constitutional Convention for huh. was to uh, ask them for the valuation of property, like escaped slaves, <sighs> right? Um, and things like that. So uh, there's certainly a degree to which um, it's not purely associational. Gotcha. Right? Yes. Great. Thank you. Any other plungers? Questions? <laughs> David, thank you. Um, I guess I'd like to ask Mark about how, uh, how different EMS services link up with things like the state and you know, municipal services. You said there's a, there's a variety of yeah. ways of doing it. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if, if the, um, yeah, I guess kind of the, the, the 
modal point, right, where they look up together. Yes, absolutely. So a municipal service is organized entirely by a local yeah. government yeah. and exists as a, as an organ of local government in the same way that, say, the police force would, or the fire department would, or the Department of Motor Vehicles. Uh, and so that's, that's fully within a local government structure. But other services, uh, including voluntary services, exist in relation to the state uh, through contractual agreements. So a voluntary service, or just like a private corporate service, uh, will contract with the local government to provide uh, EMS on whatever basis the local government decides is best. Uh, so that's a, a contractual basis for EMS, whether it's private or or quasi or a, or a community-based service in the form of voluntary uh, ambulance services. So, thank you. yeah. So, so, what do you think determines the decision about which of those three methods to go to place to use? Is there are there right. certain constraints that, that move a place to, to choose one or the other method? I. I don't know immediately the answer to your question, but I would say this, a lot of the choices that municipalities make tend to be super path dependent in respect to the existing health institutions that are already <coughs> in the particular area. So for instance, often EMS is organized around hospitals that exist within particular communities. If those hospitals are really well organized and have been historically, and there's a long tradition of uh, excellent uh, hospital care in the area, uh, a community may feel a certain amount of trust in, uh, in offering the hospital essentially a long-term contract with the community for the provision of EMS care. If that doesn't exist, then the community might decide, you know, we should run this entirely ourselves. Or another aspect of the kind of historical contingency, if you put it that way, of EMS development. In the uh, 1940s and uh, 1950s, many EMS services were provided, especially by funeral homes. That was the major locus. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. What's, yeah. The, what's the telos? <laughs> <laughs> well, they have nurses. <laughs> it's just, a, it's just an equipment issue. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so, and I think that there are still funeral homes there. Yeah. There are. Yeah, exactly. While you're actually riding in the car, that could actually take you to another much drearier place. It's interesting. Yeah, so, so so that's another example of ways that can be yeah quite contingent. But you you have some I think idea behind the question. I'd be curious what uh, well, what guess, we could make of the question. I mean, I guess the question is really um, you know what are the you know what are the conditions under which sort of a voluntary service would work out? I've never heard of that. I didn't realize that they were voluntary. Well, yes. Possible, yeah. Right. I didn't yeah. Realize that. yeah. And then you know why would there be voluntary services at all? I guess right. Mm -hmm. You know, I think so that it was just all you know sort of either private companies or municipally. Oh, how yeah. interesting. Yeah. So voluntary services are especially uh, vital or have been historically vital in rural communities. Yes. So now if, if you go to an urban community, we'll, we'll say New York, you're unlikely to have anything other than a fully professionalized service that's uh, contracted with uh, the community to provide EMS. So that's one just historical reason is that there wasn't enough money in, in rural communities to provide EMS on a professional basis. Because it's not needed. I mean, it's, uh, the density is so low, you don't know, need so much use. I think there's. I think that the Orthodox Jewish EMS <laughs> services in Brooklyn and Queens are voluntary. Right? Yeah. So they're all over the five boroughs. Okay. Uh, so and they're voluntary, voluntary services. And they are voluntary. Yeah. Uh, they have a relationship with the city, otherwise it would be licensing problems yes. and legal problems of the provision standards and so on. But they are a they are their own services. Yes. Thank, Thank you for sort of trying to make that answer even, even more complete. A lot of that is dependent on the intense fracturing of municipal government um, in most states. Uh, so uh, you'll have states where you might have 
seven or eight different jurisdictions for the purposes of providing various kinds of services within you know, a 40 mile area. Uh, and those services will all have a variety of different path dependent histories with regards to how they provide uh, various forms of aid. Um, so you might have a county that has within it two municipalities, and the county might have two different contracts, one with a volunteer EMF. It, it can get extremely complicated because of the fractured nature of local governance. Yeah. I have a question. Um, I, we have some other questions, and I just want to make sure that we get. Um, we yeah, uh, yeah. You know, we can go back to this, but I want to make sure. Um, so we have Benedict and then more. Bing, bing. Okay. Thank you. Well, my question is to Dan and to Samuel. So interesting to hear about uh, the, the discourse. It's so much about state or higher authorities on the one hand and associations and the individual on the other. My question is about the keyword family. Because did in, the, in these conventions that you were speaking of, did, uh, there's a great talk about civic associations. Is there ever talk about the family? And the same question. It's how does that come from a dysfunctional one? <laughs> <laughs> So there's, I'm there's, my best not to have <laughs> there's, there's a lot of really excellent literature on uh, sort of the notion of the Virginia uh, planter elite family, right? And the, the strange and terrifying uh, thing that it was, right? Because it revolved around sort of the powerful paternalist figure who also controlled the enslaved people, uh, who were you know subjected psychologically through violence, through sexual violence. Right, and so that was not a central theme of what the elite would discuss at these kinds of conventions, right? They, they were really much more interested in their rational self-conceptions of themselves as enlightenment creatures engaging in self-governance. There's a lot of really excellent historical unearthing of what their family communities were like, but the only way in which their notions of uh, state and family interacted was through notions of patriarchal authority. Mm -hmm. It's really, I guess, yeah. So different from the scholastic tradition where the state begins is, is like the family right. scale up. Actually, right. I did mention that the working class, the poor, survived because of their family kinship. And the same thing happens for the um, upper stratum in the former Soviet uh, countries. Uh, they are all related, intermarried, and so forth. It's not just Sicily and Compagnia. May I also respond about family and the migration? Mm -hmm. uh, the primary source of conflict that was reported to me by Solidarians between them, this is the Greek uh, mutual aid organizations, informal, between them and refugees that they worked with had to do with differences in family structure. Mm -hmm. That, um, that um, very conservative, patriarchal, very closed family structures getting along with these sort of like open, free flowing anarchists opening up squats for them to stay in. That was where, I mean, and they worked to overcome it because they felt that it was a time at which such things should be overcome or overlooked. But, um, but family was definitely the, the hottest strike point in that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to briefly weigh in actually here um, because there's a there's more than one tradition that is fed into the um, petition clause or any other aspect of the campus. Um, and Vir Virginia was coming from one tradition um, more, well, the tradition, all the traditions you cited. Um, there's also the uh, covenantal political theory, which came with the reformed Protestant immigration to the United States, um, largely to um, cert cert uh, certainly uh, Massachusetts and Connecticut and, and so on where, in fact, um, continental political theory coming out of the reformed European tradition imagines right, that you have persons, you have families, then you have communities, and the interlocking re covenantal relations of all of these is the sovereign mm -hmm. uh, from which uh, government is the representative, yeah? um, which is also part of our tradition. And these building blocks or interlocking in, um, entities, uh, is, it feeds also feeds in in, in addition to the good traditions that you mentioned. You were next. Uh, I was just going to have a bit a brief intervention about why would there be voluntary emergency medical services? Mm -hmm. in, I know in Virginia, oh, it was yeah. a function of um, the way. Battalions were raised on both sides in the fighting in Northern Virginia, that uh, the families who would go out to witness the battles were kind of the first emergency medical services who'd haul their kin into the 
hospitals and um, this I guess became something of a trend because by after 1920 I think in Roanoke Virginia they start they chartered the first volunteer rescue squads yeah. they're called rescue squads and uh, they were tied to workplace relations, mines, factories, where um, families would work, high concentration of families, and the rescue squads would be, you know, going to a disaster at the mine or at the factory and rescuing their friends and neighbors. So it, is, it does have a very much a mutual aid basis. Interestingly, Virginia remains today the state with the largest volunteer yeah. EMS association, the Virginia Beach Rescue Squad. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. So, I mean, you already sort of uh, alluded to my question, which is um, you mentioned sort of anarchists and exarchia making space available for migrants to co squat. And in Thessaloniki and other places. Oh, yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah, all over Greece, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, totally. And so um, my question was how your work considers different um, forms of mutual aid. Or um, if, because it seems like, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, it seems like you were considering um, the different kinds of, inter of interventions that happened both in Lesbos, in Thessaloniki, and uh, in London, that uh, happened in some of the near, not near, but interstices between state actors and uh, NGOs, and right? And so I was wondering how anarchist squats fit into your vocabulary for immigration. I mean, the, the, the anarchists were probably the largest social actor mm -hmm. responding to the refugee crisis. There was lots and lots and lots of different kinds of mutual aid, right? right. You know, there were small business owners who allowed people to camp on their land. There were restaurant owners who served meals. I mean, there was, you know, the things that happen whenever a crisis is suddenly visited on a society and everybody sort of turns out and helps. Um, but as far as the anarchists, like, I, I interviewed a number of people who were at, it, there, was a, there was a specific decision by the anarchists. Um, they had formed these mutual aid networks in order to deal with the collapse of the Greek welfare state in the aftermath of 2010. So you know, this is like one of my friends is you know, talking about how, his, how, how he knows no one in Greece who doesn't know someone who's killed themselves because of the austerity that was imposed. And so there's neighborhood councils, there's structures, there's methods of communication. And in December of 2014, after the migration trail had been uh, sort of discovered and widely disseminated, but before the mass had started to come through, there was an international meeting of mutual aid networks um, in Greece, um, which included mutual aid networks from everywhere from North Africa to uh, Kurdish areas of northern Syria to other European countries, with the Greeks being the biggest and best organized. Um, and at that conference, there was a formal decision to retool the networks. As far as I understand, I wasn't there. I was told about it. But there was a formal decision to retool the networks to receive half a million migrants who were who they expected to come in 2015. And a million came, or 1.1 million came, so they were off by a little bit. Um, but. <laughs> But it was a conscious decision to take mutual aid among Greeks and extend it to travelers who were not expected to stay, but were expected to pass through. The passing throughness was a problem in Hungary and was actually kind of nice in Greece because they were like, this is short term aid, we can do that. But it was also based on a sense of shared identity. One of the solidarians who was at the meeting and told me about it said that there's a very strong feeling that he says there's no distinction here between anarchists and non-anarchists with this feeling, but especially in the islands, that um, when we were expelled in 1923 from Turkey, the primary agency that aided us in resettling in Greece was chartered in Aleppo. You know, like, so now we're going to help you guys, and two generations from now, you know, like, you, you'll, you'll get us back. You know, there's no keeping tabs. There's an absolute intense, intense antipathy 
to any conception of um, aid workers and aided people. Mm -hmm. There's an intense linguistic insistence on mutualism in all of their relationships. And there's also an intense antipathy to taking NGO or entrepreneurial approaches to receiving aid from somewhere. Redistributed within, within the people that are consuming it and not taken from any outside source. Um, which, uh, which, I mean, which ended up scaling very well. It's a sort of, the difference between um, if your neighbor can't pay their rent and you put up a GoFundMe for them, that's an entrepreneurial solution. If your neighbor can't pay their rent and you throw a rent party for them and the people in your building come to the rent party, that's sort of the solidarity and solution. Um, so a lot of what I was trying to do in my paper was also to see, like, you know, here are market-based, society-based, state-based forms of mutual aid. Um, and uh, the Greek felt like the most strongly social without a state or market component. Uh, then at the same time, there was actually another social, not state or market-based component that was much smaller, which was the Golden Dawn, mm -hmm. um, were trying to forge a different model of Greek solidarity. Um, and there was a market-based component in Greece in that the mafias were trying to steal Syrian passports because they were worth a hell of a lot. If you came from somewhere else and you could buy a Syrian passport, you got citizenship in Germany, you know. Okay, Mark and Oh, if, if someone in the audience has questions, I'll defer to them. Okay. Are you sure? Okay, so. I'm, I'm share your name. Yeah, it's really, my name is Joshua Lawrence, and, uh, so after Hurricane Harvey, uh, there was a lot of discussion around the uh, questioning of persons regarding their citizenship status documentation. And so the mayor somewhat hyperbolically said, no questions asked, you help people. Uh, if somebody asks you or tries to arrest you, I'll be your lawyer. You know, so it was like this big statement, grand statement, but I think he communicated to people that you know the mayor of the city is sort of behind this, no questions asked. So there's a suspension of suspicion or, and I don't want to call that, like it was, I'm not saying everybody did that, but it did seem to operate that way. Like there were no questions asked about your citizenship or about, it was uh, a state of relate, relating that is uncommon, but like uh, I've spoken with Anna earlier, often happens in an emergency crisis situation. But I was wondering what role suspension plays, because I'm thinking about something like a Gauman, right? It's about the state of exception that becomes the norm. Right? It begins as a suspension, but then that suspension is made indefinite. So is there a positive way of saying there are things that constitute identity that may get suspended? Do they ever return if they've been suspended for long enough, like in terms of a crisis, how long the long-term recovery actually is, right? Decades on end, people's lives are never returning, and so your, uh, your identity, right, is, I don't want to say up for grabs, but in terms of mutual, I'm curious about how you would I mean, I mean, I don't think I'm necessarily the only person who can answer that. But no, that's like there was a suspension when you're in a medical emergency. There was a suspension when you're in a revolution. Like, you know, so like, you know, we're all speaking in these weird moments. Uh, this is not everyday mutual aid. These are crisis moments of mutual aid. Yeah. And yet also, this the the ability to to treat individuals qua individuals. Yeah. yeah, that, looking past not only citizenship status, sure. but much else. Absolutely. Everything yeah. else, actually. Uh, the kind of radical non-judgmentalism mm -hmm. that's a component of emergency medical practice, even in its daily form. <laughs> <laughs> and it's best. That's the ideal, anyway. Mm -hmm. Is something that EMS tries to make within practitioners a matter of, of habit, a yeah, psychological habit. And so sort of my, my ideal or my sense of what type of politics, what type of social relations can grow out of EMS yeah. as, a, as a model uh, is, is precisely that. Um, not because the, the emergency lasts forever, sure. but because the habit of thinking in an emergency becomes a central part of your life. Yeah. If I may add to that, I don't know if it's 
it's about a suspension of your identity or it's about a progression of your identity because people are in transit. Yeah. Um, I think their entire life is in flux. And I don't think they want to go back to whatever they want. I think it's a matter of adding layers and becoming something new. I think that's, in a way, the poetry of being in flux, because there's something beautiful like a renaissance. So there is an aspect of, I can become who I want to the extent that there is an agency involved. If there is just tragedy and war and life survival, there may not be a, the agency of creating whatever you want in terms of identity. But um, as, a, as an immigrant, I, I know that um, I have the freedom in a way to, um, I, I don't know, to say that, uh, what's the nice thing of saying about Romania? It's a nice place to live from. So, <laughs> <laughs> or not. Um, okay. Well, and I, I think that I would, I would add to that, that that there are different there are there, there are some who return and some who don't in a sense right like right now there's a mass return to Syria because much of the country has been depending on your political you know angle liberated or you know reconquered or whatever but you know the point is that as stability returns many people wish for home you know like life in Germany is not that great for you know, many of the people that have ended up there. Um, there was a period of time when I uh, lived in Chicago that I was very connected to the Michoacana O'Connor community, and there were these uh, uh, mutual aid self-defense groups growing up in Michoacan State in Mexico, and tons and tons of people who'd lived for 20 years in the United States were returning home because they were like, it's safe enough to raise my kids at home again. They didn't lose their sense of that home, right? Um, so I think that, you know, in a crisis, like, there may be some suspension of something. Um, there may be a way that, like, you know, after Hurricane Katrina, you discover that you can, you, you have a wider range of employment possibilities in Dallas. So, like, I'm going to try to live in Dallas now. I'm going to try to make this new life. I'm going to try to be this new me. But I'm always going to miss, you know, you know, Mrs. Brown downstairs in my church around the corner and the kind of food that I like to eat. I mean, to, to, to be displaced either because you've left or because someone else has come and the world has changed around you is, you know, you don't necessarily, many people don't yearn to be permanently changed. You they yearn to get work. back to normal. I think I think we should also remember yeah. that on the part of the hosts, mm -hmm. there uh, might, there might be an embrace and and wellspring of mutual mutualism and aid for a while, but there is no happy teleological line. Uh, and we see this in Germany, which you know you know shocking the us, and we're gonna we're gonna do this in uh, and then. Not only did that sentiment restrict, but it also became the platform for the rise yeah. of the um, AFD, the uh, Alternative for Deutschland on the right. Um, so the you know you can have you you can have a, a, a mutualist or um, response that retracts. We we don't have necessarily a teleological line. Um, I want to make sure that we get to other um, if there are other questions in the. Um, audience, I know that both of you wanted to, to comment, but are there questions from the floor? Uh, David, do you have one? Oh, sure, let me ask. So, uh, I guess one question that arises for me, is, 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 is um, kind of the, the preconditions for um, the arise of kind of mutual aid rather than total chaos, yeah, because <laughs> right? you can imagine, right, you know, so like, these are situations where somehow the state is unable or somehow unwilling or whatever it is, it's not there to carry out the functions, whether it's, you know, the company of the migrants or the TNS, certainly there's a possibility, there's always a possibility that it just totally, you know, breaks down, there's chaos, and it just, yeah, what's, <laughs> do you have any sense of, like, what, what can lead to one direction or the other? Is, is it bad of the people or is it, I mean, it, it, This is one of the few things I have a terse response to. Okay. <laughs> so my terse response is that 
uh, while there is routine mutual aid, which is not what I think we're talking about right now, this kind of flowering of mutual aid is a response to a situation which is catastrophic and which has a very short period of time between the warning and the impact. If the amount of time between the warning and the impact is dragged out, uh, it tends to lead to chaos. There's a body of sociology on that. But if, the, if it's sudden, people tend to band together. I guess one, one thing to sort of take, take two angles on that. One is that oftentimes the kind of moments of exception that lead to the creation of mutual aid networks can be applied selectively, right? So some elements of uh, identity are suspended in favor of mutual aid, while other elements are not suspended, right? Um, or the suspension itself is clearly limited in duration in terms of time or impact. Um, and just sort of silly but useful example is a membership in the Continental Army during uh, the war, which suspended some elements of people's identity in the name of becoming part of the mutual self-defense project, but not all of them, right? not all parts of their identity, nor did that uh, stick around for a particularly long time. It was well known that people like, you know, went for a year and just left, right? Uh, so uh, I think that that's, that's an example sort of of both partial and temporary decisions to engage in mutual aid when states of exception are, are invoked and might require that kind of mutual aid. So it's quite limited in some cases, I think is one way to think about it. Mm -hmm. But I take it the upshot of your question is how do you construct institutions in non-emergency circumstances that put into kind of spiritual practice of mutuality that needs to be at the core of sort of future social vision? Yeah, but the EMS is more, it's more long term. Right? Yes. Uh, it's not the situation. Yeah. Well, it's a string of crises. Well, but it's a small fraction of yeah. Right, but it's, but, but it's established uh, mm -hmm. permanent structure. Yes. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Not just big differences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The EMS networks are a very self propagating network in, in local politics. Um, uh -huh. And um, you know, yeah. they're, they're, they're incredibly civically active and they're yeah. excellent at uh, recruitment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that they are sort of self thriving organizations in that way. They really assert themselves um, in the uh, Richmond Metropolitan area, for example. They draw very extensively on medical students, nurses, um, and other people who might want to get the kind of experience they offer. So. Um, they're, they tend to be self-driving institutions, yeah. and that's part of part of what makes them so effective. Um, I'm going to thank all of our panelists and all of you for a very wonderful session. I think we have a few minute break, and then we start up again. Thank you.